Okay, let's uh, look at some of the subaxial uh, spine. So obviously uh, the fetal spine, uh, subaxial spine, uh, very fragile little area. And I love that slide, just showing the perspective of the amount of surface area that the foramen magnum has compared to the rest of the spine. It almost, you know, it could engulf the entire thing. So uh, this is a little phrase I like to say, um, spines are like snowflakes, no two are alike. Uh, where's Dr. Johnson? He, he's the one that's supposed to laugh. <laughs> Actually, that's uh, attributed to Pat Johnson, but <laughs> the speed of uh, PowerPoint, right? So I thought I'd take uh, us from the very beginning, look at some of the basics of the osteology of the cervical spine, and we'll stay away from C1 and C2. Those are topics uh, on their own. And then move around the C-spine and then add layers of neurovascular, muscular structures, uh, ligamentous structures, and then uh, try to bring that all together as far as uh, what's uh, the most important from the perspective of a spine surgeon. So looking at the front of the cervical spine and the subaxial uh, spine in particular, cervical spine, we see uh, the anterior parts of the bodies and these are interlocked very nicely. A lot more mobility to the cervical spine uh, compared to the lumbar spine, therefore you need special things to try to lock those bodies in with each other and the adaptation of uh, our cervical spine is the creation of these uncinate processes forming an uncovertebral joint. So these are very useful, especially in rotation of the cervical uh, spine uh, and help to maintain that architecture, especially since just on the lateral aspect of the uncinate process is our intervertebral foramen um, running out to our neural sulcus and obviously our vertebral artery that's just here in the front. There was speculation uh, for decades and decades as to whether or not this uh, uncovertebral joint was actually a synovial joint or just uh, seen uh, as a degenerative situation in man. And um, probably five or six years ago, someone finally identified synovial cells there. So um, it probably is some type of rudimentary synovial joint and not just a um, result of uh, osteoarthritis. We'll note that um, as we go through, the bodies of the cervical vertebrae are fairly flat, they're rectangular uh, in shape um, with a left to right um, length that's greater than the AP width. If we start to rotate a little bit, we can see the wide open uh, intervertebral foramina. You can see the relationship of that to the uncinate uh, processes here. Uh, aside from uh, C2, and if we look three to seven, you'll notice that uh, the transverse processes are um, modified in the cervical region, and we have uh, both an anterior and a posterior tubercle. Those are connected by a little bar, the costal transverse bar, and that's what the uh, spinal nerve will sit on. The uh, dorsal root ganglion for relationship is going to be just adjacent to uh, the transverse uh, foramen, as we'll see. And then as you get down to C7, the vertebra prominence, you'll notice that it does not really have an anterior tubercle. However, its uh, neighbor to the north, C6, has usually the largest anterior tubercle. And do you know what that's referred to as? Carotid tubercle or Shashanax tubercle. Um, and described as the carotid tubercle because you can push the carotid artery against it as a backboard and uh, seal off the carotid if it's uh, bleeding. This is a more lateral view that shows you the uh, intervertebral foramina. We see the neural sulcus, uh, transverse foramina are seen, and you see transverse foramina throughout all seven cervical vertebrae. Uh, however, the vertebral artery normally doesn't enter the C7 transverse foramen, but the vertebral vein does. Uh, so it tends to be a little smaller in size. Normally, the vertebral artery will enter the C6 transverse foramen, um, but there's a bell-shaped curve, so some will enter up uh, upstream. You can have some downstream entrance. You can have a transverse foramen of T1. That's very rare. Uh, a little more lateral, this is a, a beautiful um, view that shows you how shingled the articular facets are, the set joint, just like that. Um, now this is a dry specimen, so it's not coated with articular cartilage, but it gives you an idea of that shingling effect. And even though we say that these uh, facet joints are in the transverse plane, um, they really are almost at a, a 45 degree angle. <clears throat> 
uh, posterior view. Uh, you can look at this forensically if you found this out in the you know, uh, park. Uh, you'd know that this is probably from a Caucasian uh, individual because Caucasians tend to have these bifid spinous processes uh, compared to other ethnicities which tend to have a single non-bifid cervical spinous process. The vertebral prominence normally does not have a bifid process uh, and between these two little bifid processes you would have uh, your interspinous uh, ligaments, you would have your interspinous muscles and then the nuchal ligament attaching up and down all the way up to the inion which is uh, not seen in this picture. Uh, left lateral view a little bit rotated, you can really see the um, course of the vertebral, excuse me, the transverse foramina where the vertebral artery would ascend, right? Remember ascending anterior to where our nerve roots are coming out. And remember just located here in this little concavity behind the uh, transverse foramen is where you see the dorsal root ganglion. Uh, perfect view through the little sulcus here. Remember this is the anterior and posterior tubercles. Uh, this is our uh, costal transverse bar which uh, supports the uh, nerve as it's leaving. Normally the ventral ramus uh, will come off here so it travels more in the gutter of this area whereas the dorsal ramus will exit just behind the posterior tubercle to run out to innervate three things, the deep dorsal muscles of the back, so the native back muscles, the facet joint and the skin of the back. Everything else is going to be innervated by the ventral ramus, hence the larger size of that structure. You also see as you start to come down that uh, the C5 ventral ramus will tend to be a little larger um, and that's because of its contribution and uh, C6, C7, C8 to the brachial plexus whereas the ventral rami of C4 and up are much smaller. Nice view of the uncinate process and uh, where the uncovertebral joint would be. Do you know the uh, eponym associated with the uncovertebral joint? Joints of Lushka? Right, so Lushka, von Lushka, very famous German anatomist from the 1800s, um, has about 100 thing, things named after him, one being the joints of Lushka. Uh, interesting perspective looking down the barrel of the gun. Uh, so we're looking at C1 all the way down uh, to body of C7 down there, and you can see the um, vertebral canal. Uh, these are the posterior elements uh, going down. Remember, uh, posterior arch of C1 is unique and then the rest will follow a similar form and fashion as you go down. Vertebral foramen at each level is roughly heart shaped. You can see a picture uh, here. Uh, the transverse uh, versus the AP diameter as we mentioned, right, it's longer this way versus it is this way. Uh, the uncinate processes make these uh, unique. We have our anterior and posterior tubercles. Um, mostly muscles, it's intuitive that come from the back are going to attach to the posterior tubercles. Muscles in the front, like the scalenes, uh, the longus capitis and coli, are going to attach to the anterior tubercles. Uh, a nice depiction of our costal transverse bar here that's the lateral aspect of the transverse foramen. It's also interesting to see that the superior articular facets face posteriorly and the inferior articular facets that we'll see on the next view face anteriorly. Uh, that's how you get the shingling effect between those uh, adjacent vertebrae. And again, the facet joints are in the transverse plane. Facet joints are innervated uh, specifically, as we just mentioned, by the dorsal ramus of the uh, spinal nerves in this area, and they're usually uh, from an adjacent spinal, cervical spinal nerve. So a, a close-up of uh, that region. Inferiorly uh, and facing uh, the opposite direction are inferior um, uh, facets. Um, Obviously this is from an older person, we're starting to see some um, egression into the vertebral canal from the vertebral body, nice anterior and posterior uh, tubercles. And from a practical standpoint, uh, if we're um, targeting the pedicles, um, our friends uh, at AO uh, have put together very beautiful pictures that show you about where that entrance site is, uh, even though you can't uh, see it uh, if you're not using stealth imaging. Um, we see that's usually just below the facet joint. Everybody that comes to this podium, and we see hundreds of spine surgeons a year, have a little bit of a different uh, um, game plan that they use. So this is just uh, one group's um, intonation. Uh, 
Uh, the angulation, again, varies from person to person. Remember, from snowflake to snowflake, and we see the 45 degree approximately. As you go up, it can be 50, especially around C3. It can drop to around the 40s as you go in the lower cervical spine. Um, very uh, variable, again, from person to person. I think most people, especially when they go to the lab, they're always surprised at how lateral you have to swing out for your target. Um, the pedicles. Um, are really laterally placed and take a very lateral angulation. You don't want to swing up in the sagittal plane because uh, um, as uh, our expert spine fellows in the back will tell you, if you do that, you get into the spinal nerve, right? Uh, which is hovering there in that spinal groove. And if you're off just a millimeter or less, you get into the transverse foramen and uh, you can puncture not only uh, vertebral artery, but you can sky through the vertebral venous plexus that surrounds that artery as it's uh, coming down and it's uh, um, going up in its ascension. Uh, the costal part, this is just a cool picture. It has nothing to do with the surgery, but it shows you in uh, color the costal parts of the entire uh, spine in humans. So if you look at a snake, he has, or she has uh, ribs all the way up and down, all the cervical, all the thoracic, all the lumbar, all the sacral, they have ribs attached. And uh, in uh, man, we're left with uh, a remnant here for C1, uh, particular for the subaxial spine, we see uh, the transverse processes like this. Uh, obviously in the um, thoracic cavity, it's more obvious. Lumbar region, little nubbins, and then the ala of the sacrum. You can look at some of the uh, better derivations. So for the posterior tubercle, you can see just behind that, that's equivalent to the ribs uh, uh, tubercle. Uh, the head of the rib is here as the anterior tubercle. This is our costal transverse bar, uh, which can be incompetent. Sometimes you see those, they're not fully fused. So some of the muscles that we see in this region, uh, this is uh, a posterior view uh, for the spine surgeons. Uh, this often gets clumped together as paraspinal musculature. Um, we try to hold uh, the fellow's hands to the fire and make them learn these muscles uh, at least one time. And then uh, we see here with trapezius uh, running and covering up the back of the suboxial spine and from uh, the Indian all the way down to T12. So that's the first layer that you go through. Um, I'll go through these uh, relatively quickly. The next layer is the splenius capitis. And the splenius capitis is great. It's right here on the nuchal ligament. So you can follow those uh, little oblique fibers down to the nuchal ligament. When you uh, retract those, you'll see the underlying semispinalis capitis, which is here. Uh, we're not gonna go up into the suboccipital region, but this is uh, the posterior arch, uh, excuse me, this is the spinous process of C1 at this point. This is where the semispinalis cervicis attaches. Uh, little inner spinalis muscles that are clinically, I think, inconsequential that uh, will be um, dissected free. Here's the overlying nuchal ligament with uh, fascicular and funicular components as uh, described by Felding. Uh, a nicer view that I think highlights, again, the nuchal ligament running here in the midline, relatively avascular on either side of the semispinalis capitis. And to be aware of, if you're a little off, you can ding the third occipital nerves uh, that are cutaneous mm -hmm. to the back of the occiput. Um, you could uh, ding the uh, greater occipital nerves if you're here and the occipital artery is not far away. Uh, just to remember that lots of muscles uh, attached to the subaxial cervical spine, we mentioned the semispinalis uh, services, but also muscles that help hold your shoulders up. So like the levator scapula attaches to the upper four um, cervical vertebrae. So if you're aggressive with the monopolar out laterally, you can detach that muscle and they might have difficult, patient may have difficulty shrugging their shoulders, especially if the trapezius has been uh, burned a little bit with the cautery. From an anterior lateral approach, some of the uh, relevant clinical and surgical anatomy, uh, remember the omohyoid is your friend and swings out here in the um, but just behind the clavicle running from the highway down to the scapula and is a, uh, a blinking uh, red light that says caution, the IJ is just behind me. So IJ is just here, um, carotid in uh, vagus nerve in the carotid sheath. Lateral to that, we see lots of branches that are stemming out underneath the sternocleidomastoid. This is going out to the cervical plexus, so great auricular, transverse cervical, supraclavicular, lesser occipital, those branches. So um, lateral to the SCM, you're going to have potentially a cutaneous defect if you're doing something from that trajectory. Mm -hmm. 
the motor defect you can get is if you get here into the accessory nerve that joins into the trapezius at about the junction of the upper third and lower two thirds of the uh, sternocleidomastoid. A little deeper dissection, Omohawi again. The IJ has been removed so we can see a nice uh, view of the vagus nerve. Here's our uh, C4 ventral ramus. So this is going out to primarily the cervical cutaneous plexus. This is C5 that's coming out between the anterior middle scalenes and will join up with C6. Excuse me, this is C4. This is C5 down here. This is anterior scalene. And we see the continuation of uh, the carotid uh, sheath. Here are some of the superhyoid muscles, hyoid bone. What level, what vertebral level does the hyoid bone sit at? C3, right? So C3, uh, if you push on the hyoid bone, if you're pushing on the thyroid cartilage, that's uh, C4, C5, and then the cricoid down here under cover is C6. A little wider view, so this would be kind of the corridor that we use uh, to get in between the carotid sheath and uh, the trachea and esophagus for ACDFs. Uh, we see out laterally the trunks of the brachial plexus, uh, anterior scalene with the overlying phrenic nerve that passes down into the thorax between the subclavian vein and artery that would be here. Remembering subclavian arteries behind the anterior scalene, so it's relatively safe. Uh, common carotid on the left, and it's the area just here between the trachea, and you can see a little bit of the esophagus uh, pooching out that we find the recurrent laryngeal nerve in that so-called uh, tracheoesophageal groove. Scalene muscles, uh, just a schematic that shows you their attachment. Um, I think a good surgical landmark is that if you see the anterior scalene's medial edge, if you see the longest services or Coley's medial edge and then put in the first rib, that represents the so-called vertebral artery triangle. And you should palpate at the apex of that triangle, the C6 carotid tubercle, and the vertebral artery runs just in the middle of that. Sometimes it's so deeply found, and this is the V1 segment of the vertebral artery, it's so deeply uh, placed that you don't notice it if you're in this area. So it's there, um, the stellate ganglion is nearby it, so uh, lots of um, important things to be aware of. So longus cervices ascends all the way up to the anterior arch of C1, longus capitis is lateral and ascends up to the skull base. Um, residents are always asking, you know, where is the sympathetic chain or, gang or trunk in relationship to this when they're doing approaches, and the sympathetic trunk runs conveniently on the longus capitis, right? So if you're way out on longus capitis, you're endangering the sympathetic trunk and a potential Horner syndrome. Uh, it's behind the prevertebral fascia, so as long as you stay in front of the prevertebral fascia uh, laterally, you should be safe from the injury. This is the vertebral artery uh, triangle with uh, here being our subclavian artery, the first component. There's the anterior scalene, trachea. Uh, we see from a lateral to medial perspective, the phrenic nerve, right, which often has this uh, lateral component uh, we see separately from C5. And as we move medially over the subclavian, we see the um, vagus nerve. And then most medially, as you can see the recurrence here, this is the right-sided recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, and essentially, when, the, when they're in the tracheoesophageal groove, they're both running about uh, the same course. Uh, at uh, the first rib level, we'll see the stellate ganglia. At C6, where the uh, cricoid cartilage is, we'll see the middle cervical ganglia. And then variably up behind the internal carotid arteries, where you'll find the uh, superior cervical ganglia. Branches that people forget about uh, is that the recurrent laryngeal nerve is it's running up in the tracheoesophageal groove, and this is exactly sometimes where your retractor blade can be placed, is that you also have tracheal and esophageal branches. We just finished an uh, anatomical study that looked at the um, potential for retractor blades not really injuring the recurrent as it's up higher, but dinging these esophageal branches as a possible cause of dysphagia after this type of surgery. As you go up higher around C3, between C3, C4, C5, you have to contend with the internal laryngeal branch, which supplies the mucosa above the vocal cords. Uh, just in theory to that, these both arising from superior laryngeal nerve. We have the external laryngeal branch that goes to cricothyroid. Um, who knows what happens if you ding the external laryngeal branch? Uh, 
you, you lose uh, the ability to change the pitch of your uh, voice, so you have a monotone. So patients will complain of a potentially of a monotone if you knock that out. Uh, importantly, and um, most medical schools skip this for some reason, that that external branch also supplies the superior pharyngeal constrictor. Uh, excuse me, inferior pharyngeal constrictor, so that uh, could be loss of uh, motion of that muscle and can contribute to dysphagia if you've uh, injured that nerve. Um, the nerve conveniently runs just medial to the superior thyroid artery, so as if you stay away from superior thyroid artery, you should stay away from this branch. The fascial planes, um, I think if I ever uh, were to have a tattoo, I'd get something like that on me, isn't that cool? Um, very tattoo-esque. Uh, axial section that shows all of the fascial compartments, and in particular here, we're looking at uh, cervical vertebrae. This is uh, the C5 nerve, uh, C6 nerve, here's C5 coming down from above, forming in this prevertebral fascia, the upper trunk of the plexus. This is the carotid uh, sheath here, and we see the vagus. Behind the carotid sheath, we see the prevertebral fascia with our sympathetic trunk ascending. Uh, obviously, vertebral artery that's just in front of the dorsal rig ganglion. The venous uh, plexuses around the subaxial cervical spine uh, are grouped into Batson's plexus, so um, external posterior, we have uh, anterior posterior internals, and then anterior external. These all communicate freely with, for example, the deep cervical vein that you'll see if you're dissecting near the semispinalis services posteriorly. They communicate freely with the vertebral venous plexus, both inside the transverse foramen and also just anterior to it via the anterior vertebral vein. And then uh, based on a study that we did a couple of years ago, there's free movement here between the marginal, the occipital sinus, the basilar venous plexus, and these upper um, Batson's components. Not to forget that uh, all of these small little arteries that we find in the neck uh, are giving off branches, especially from uh, the vertebral artery, but also from the deep cervical artery, sometimes the ascending uh, cervical, potentially the ascending pharyngeal. So if those get cauterized with various approaches, you can cut off the spinal branches here that are going back to supply the spinal cord. Uh, so they rely uh, on those vessels. This is a, a nice depiction of the sympathetic ganglia and their association with the vertebral artery here in the back. Uh, carotids pulled forward. We see a nice uh, nerve sulcus here for the egress of the lower um, ventral rami that are going out to the brachial plexus. Here's our uh, C8, T1 fibers coming out as the lower trunk over the first rib. Vascular supply uh, of the bone is also important. Uh, this shows uh, the uh, upper part of the subaxial cervical um, spine and the branches. These are all um, bone branches. Uh, and then we see some branches, especially as you go up to C2, that are supplying the alar transverse ligaments. Um, these are supplying primarily the posterior longitudinal ligament. Great axial view, uh, we see uh, the dura, uh, with the cervical spinal cord, our dorsal ventral rootlets that are segregated on function, separated by the dentate ligaments here intradurally, um, are tethered both posteriorly and anteriorly by arachnoid trabeculae, and then the dural sac itself is suspended in the vertebral canal by Hoffman's ligaments, little uh, meningeal ligaments that help keep it oriented in the correct fashion, and it's within that area that we have our epidural space with uh, all of our external um, excuse me, posterior internal parts of Batson, um, anterior internal parts, uh, the spinal nerve, the ganglion. Here at the sulcus, we see the uh, rami communicantes, uh, and in the cervical region in particular, we just have gray ramus communicans connecting to the sympathetic trunk. Um, this is dorsal ramus, much smaller. That's going back to our native back muscles, facet joints, and skin of the back. This is our much larger ventral ramus here, kind of wedged between the anterior and posterior tubercles of uh, this transverse process. Uh, a cartoonish looking view here, but it shows nicely the relationship, the DRGs here, um, and their relationship to the vertebral artery. Uh, we see dorsal rami coming out. Uh, importantly, not only do the ventral rami go out and help form cervical and brachial plexus, but some of the posterior rami, and they're not supposed to do this, but they communicate and form this dorsal nervous network of cruvier. So you can pull on a 
cervical nerve branch that's here in the plexus and you can inadvertently put traction on the greater occipital nerve, for example, um, even though you're away from the C2 level. Uh, not to forget the recurrent meningeal branch, right? This little branch comes off near where the spinal nerve is formed here in the gutter or this nerve sulcus. It goes back inside the spinal canal, does not innervate the facet joint as does our um, dorsal rami, but supplies uh, the um, anterior dura, it supplies the posterior annulus, supplies the posterior longitudinal ligament, and some studies have suggested that it also supplies this epidural fat in the blood vessels that run with it. Uh, we have a strong anterior longitudinal ligament that runs uh, anterior on the subaxial spine and then uh, becomes the anterior lano um, axial and lano occipital membranes as you go up beyond the subaxial spine. The uh, posterior longitudinal ligament that's seen here, remember, continues cephalad as the tectorial membrane, which is important in cranial cervical stability. Uh, this is an old picture, but it's a, a cool picture, I think, from an anatomical standpoint, looking at the, in millimeters, uh, the average uh, amount of what makes up um, both the bone and the disc components of the cervical spine. Um, approximately a fourth of uh, your height is contributed to by the disc. Remember, we have uh, primary curvature that uh, as you start to hold the head up as an infant, then you get a lordosis of uh, the cervical spine. Um, curvatures, again, primary is from the vertebrae. Uh, the secondary curvatures, such as the lordosis that you see with the cervical spine, the lumbar spine, are primarily due to the um, uh, secondary to the disc. Uh, and in the cervical region, the intervertebral disc are taller anteriorly. Um, and whereas uh, the lumbar, um, just for comparison, uh, both the disc and the bodies are taller anteriorly. Uh, then finally, just for ossification centers with the cervical and the subaxial uh, cervical spine in particular, we have our two neural arches, right? And then we have a centrum and those fuse together um, approximately three to four years of age. So after that, you should have ossification. You can occasionally have an ossification center that's uh, centered here at the base of the spinous process. All right, thank you.